Thank you all for coming. Uh, today we have uh, speakers from uh, the CS department in the Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence group. Um, the group is on the second floor, uh, mostly on the second floor in, of this building. Uh, please stop by, yes. Thank you for the woo. Uh, <laughs> first up, we got John Thixton. Uh, his advisor is Sham Kakade and Zaid Harchawi. Um, he's gonna talk about generative models. Um, and if you're wondering like, huh, I do ML, I do AI, why wasn't I asked to be pre uh, presenting today? Well, you obviously aren't a part of the Slack group, uh, <laughs> of the MLAI group. So if you'd like to be a part of uh, different announcements in the MLAI group, please uh, join the Slack channel. Um, also, you're going to be seeing um, some very smart looking MLAI t-shirts around soon, and you're gonna, be wanna, you're gonna wanna be a part of that. You're gonna want one of those shirts. So stop by, say hello, um, and please welcome John Thixton. So today I'll be talking about, yeah, robust generative modeling and generic problem domains, emphasis on robust and emphasis on generic. Uh, and I'll say, say up front, this is a sort of an aspirational talk. I don't have great answers to these questions of how to do this, but I'll, I'll lead you through my thought process of, of why I'm interested in these questions and, and where I'm coming from and some ideas and directions of how to tackle this. Uh, so, so last year I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, generative models for music, uh, where you can kind of build up this sequential autoregressive model, predicting basically one note at a time, conditioned on the previous notes that you've generated, to get a process that sort of looks like this, where you build things up sequentially, temporally. And we can play some sound to hear what this sounds like. So there you go, fake music. There's a lot of a lot of Bach in there, a lot of uh, a lot of Renaissance music. Uh, can we cut the sound? So, so in the process of doing this, actually, actually, you know, we got some reasonable results, but but I really felt like I struggled with this pro process. Uh, one problem I ran into is that I had a lot of trouble capturing really long-term structure in music. So, so music, you know, the very beginning of a song is really still reflected in, in the end, say, 100 measures later. And, and that was really hard for me to capture in these sequential models where after a while the model just kind of forgets what was happening. Uh, and beyond this, I also just had trouble just getting these models off the ground, getting them to produce anything reasonable. Uh, just trouble parameterizing the model, searching for the hyperparameters. And, and this was not, not at all robust, and, and I had a terrible time doing this. Um, and at the same time I was working on this, I sort of had an eye to what was going on in the vision community, where people are generating these, so these are fake faces. These are not people that actually exist, they're sampled from a model, and uh, I've been looking at this stuff now for, for six to 12 months, and I can kind of say, you know, if you, maybe if you don't trust the community, uh, trust me, who's sort of an outsider on the vision, pro like this is, they're not cheating. This is like, these results are, are real in a sense, you can measure log likelihoods, yeah. Uh, so these ones do not, there are some that do. Yes, there are some that are built up sort of sequentially the same way that I was building the music. Um, they haven't quite gotten these impressive results at this scale, um, but you actually do have to generate every pixel here. So even if, however you're producing it, you do have to have an opinion about what every pixel should be, and this is 1024 by 1024 <laughs> images. Um, and they're clearly, like, they're clearly getting long-term structure right here, right? This, this question of like, how to be consistent across thousands of pixels, they've got that nailed. And, and they're also doing it with astonishingly little data. So, so one thing I was wondering while I was working on this problem in music is, is well, maybe I just don't have enough data to do this. Maybe, maybe I just need more to get off the ground and get going. They're producing these images on 70,000 training examples. Um, some of these other images, NVIDIA has this progressive training of GANs paper, they're training on 30,000 images. So these are from, you know, like, this is, big data isn't the answer to these questions. People are solving these problems and getting striking results with strikingly small amounts of data. Uh, so, Given this, I, I wanted to know what's up, see if there was any ideas that I could, I could take home to, to my problem in, in music. So I started reading these papers, and there's a lot of them. And they just go on and on and on. And the crazy thing about these papers is this isn't so, so the, I mean, you may have heard some of, some of the popular ideas going on in this generative modeling space of GANs. And sure, there's like a 1,001 GAN papers with minor tweaks. But like each of these ones I'm flashing on the screen here, like there's genuine, creative, new, different ways of thinking about this problem in each of these papers. And, and everyone's getting these amazing results, not everybody, but you know, the people with the funding. And, um, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and like there's, a, there's, there's probably 10 strikingly unique ways to tackle this problem now in the vision space. Um, 
And, and this brings me to sort of a, a principle that I've been formulating, a uh, fundamental principle of deep learning, which is that it doesn't really matter how you formulate your problem, how you set up the model. Uh, if you are willing to make the research investment, hire a bunch of smart AI researchers who know what they're doing to, to figure out which architectures to write down, and then spend the computational budget to, to really drill down and find exactly how to tune the hyperparameters on these models. It doesn't matter whether you are using a VAE or a GAN or, a, or one of these flow-based models. You can make anything work and get brilliant results. Uh, and, and in a sense, this is kind of cool because it's created this sort of cottage industry where people can, can, can produce these papers where they dream up some novel, creative new way to solve this problem, and then they hit it with a deep learning hammer, spend a million dollars on AWS, and, and get these amazing results and say, look at this creative way to do generative modeling. But it's not satisfying at all from a robustness and genericness perspective because basically what you've told me by saying that this is the answer to my problem is that if I want to get good generative models for music, I need to convince the AI community, you know, five or 10 research groups with really strong researchers to start thinking about this problem and think about it for a few years to figure out what the architecture should be. And then I need to convince Google or Facebook or one of these companies with deep pockets to spend a million dollars to really identify the architecture that's gonna get me all the way to really crisp results. And this is just not something that scales to, to diverse problem domains. Like we can solve some certain problems, narrow problems in vision or in NLP with this, but, but this, isn't, like, this isn't the answer to all problems that we wanna apply machine learning to. Uh, so, one question I have is, is, is can you do this? So, so these results have lit the way of what's possible. Like certainly we know we have enough data to solve these problems. The, we can generalize from, from, from what we've got. Can we do it better? Can we do it without relying so much on these large compute budgets? Can we do it in a more generic way? Uh, and, and to give you a sense of, of that, that I feel that this really should be possible, I'm gonna spend the second half of this talk kind of walking you through um, a very simple example of how, of how the way that you choose to model this problem can really help or burn you. Um, so in this zoo of generative models and vision, uh, I'm just gonna single out one that I'm gonna pick on pretty hard, which is this autoregressive model, which is the same kind of model that I was using for, for music, where I generate one note at a time, put an order on notes, and walk forward generating. And, and, and in the vision space, this goes by these names like Nade or Image Transformer. Uh, and, and these are these models that literally generate a pixel at a time and just generate the first pixel of the image, maybe the one in the upper left corner, and then go to the next one, generate that, generate that, keep going. Uh, and, and in contrast to this, most of the other models in the vision space are these latent code models, and, and these work a little differently. Here, instead of generating a pixel at a time and where the randomness is coming in from the sampling of, that I made on the previous pixels, here I generate a latent code that somehow is supposed to capture some, some quality of the image that I want to generate, and push this code through a neural network and generate an image globally all at once. Uh, and I'm gonna to try to make the case to you that, that this latent code idea is really just a better idea for, for solving these problems with long-term structure. Uh, and to do this, I'm gonna take a look at a, a toy data set. This is MNIST, except it's even, it's even simpler than NNIST. It's MNIST where everything is, all the pixels are either zero or one. So this is like the simplest data you can imagine. It's great because you can actually do science on this. I can run experiments in 10 minutes and figure out what's what. I don't have to, I don't have to, to spend my, my annual AWS cloud budget just to, just to try something out. Uh, and let's look at what happens on this binarized MNIST digit if I try to run one of these autoregressive models that generates pixel by pixel using just a simple fully connected neural network. This is what I get. This is kind of trash. Uh, and you say, well, okay, well, this is just like a fully connected network. Uh, there's some theorist like messing around with this stuff. This is no good. I need convolutions because this is vision, right? So I should be, I should be, you know, scanning over this stuff. And, and so I build my comnet, and I still get trash. So it turns out this is actually pretty hard to get this to work. Um, I ended up like I did not get this myself. I went online and I found somebody's Git repo where they sort of got this working, and they gave me this like ten-layer deep network with batch norm and fiddling with the number of filters and everything, and then reasonable stuff starts to pop out. But to give you a sense of how sensitive this is, let's say I just get rid of the batch norm on these comms, everything falls apart again, and I get, I get trash. And, and this isn't like I didn't optimize for long enough, like batch norm often gets, gets presented as, oh, like this accelerates learning, but this is binarized MNIST, and I can run this for 500 epochs in half an hour, and I still have nothing, I've gotten nowhere. So, so some interesting kind of regularization that's happening with this batch norm that I don't think people really talk about or, or have justified in any way. 
So that's frustrating. Uh, but, but we saw in the previous slide that this sort of can be done if you're willing to, to hammer it hard enough. You can get good results out of this autoregressive model. But let's look what happens with a variational autoencoder. This is one of these latent code networks that hallucinates digits sort of all at once. And again, I take just like the simplest thing that I know how to do, which is just this fully connected neural network, doesn't understand anything about structure. And, and immediately, digits pop out. Like stuff that looks somewhat reasonable is there. And it just like, I didn't work at all. Um, and you know, I can, I can parameterize the ComNet and do better. Uh, and, and it just seems like this is like a better way to set up this problem than, than the autoregressive model. And, uh, and, and, my, and my claim is that, is that really going forward, um, so, so talking about research directions, uh, can we do better? Like, can we identify not just like, sure, like with, armed with deep learning, I can build, I, I can make any model work. I can, I can find the right parameterization where everything pops, but can I find models where, where simpler parameterizations work just out of the box, where I don't have to fight so hard with the system, pay so much in compute to get these results? And the VAE looks really pr promising in this, from this perspective because I can do something really simple and immediately get results out. Now, it doesn't go all the way. In practice, what we see is that, is that, that they don't scale as I try to increase the parameter counts and build a more expressive model. I never do quite as well as some of these GANs and other formulations. So, so a concrete research question I'm thinking right, about right now is can we fix the VAE? Can we do better with this particular model that seems so promising? Um, but more generally, uh, a more sort of open-ended question is can we formalize this idea of, of a model being easy to parameterize versus hard? Because one thing that people in ML like to do is we like to compete. And right now, everybody competes on uh, like um, model performance. But, but at the end of the day, like, like I kind of want to compete not on, on sort of given this, given this model, what's the, the most I can squeeze out of it, but what can, what can I easily squeeze out of it? What can, I, what can I get without working too hard? Because this is what's going to let me go to new problem domains, plug this in, and get good results without dropping the big compute budget. Uh, and then just, just in, in taking this idea and thinking more broadly, can the ML community escape from this local maximum that we are sort of stuck in, where we're just like writing every paper to try to get state-of-the-art performance numbers on a problem at whatever cost necessary? And can we figure out ways to get this with better models, with models that are cheaper to compute with? Uh, so there's some people, some colleagues, I'm not sure in the audience today, but uh, at Allen NLP and here at UW that are thinking about this from a slightly different perspective, from the green AI perspective, which is like, damn, if I spent a million dollars on AWS, I mean, like, I, that's a big carbon footprint that I've spent. So can I, can I come up with, a, um, with models that are more energy efficient? Uh, and, and, and that's sort of the goal, that's the questions I'm thinking about, and with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, something that's really nice about autoregressive networks is that you can use it to evaluate the probability of, mm -hmm. of your data, right? Yeah. What's your, and that's something you can't do with, for example, a, a VAE. So um, you actually can do it with a VAE. Uh, you need to do some important sampling to estimate it, but you get this lower bound, and then you can do important sampling to actually estimate the likelihood and do reasonably well. Um, that is an advantage of autoregressive models that it just directly pops out. There are other models. There's these like flow-based models, MVPs, that you can also get log likelihoods out of. Right. But I agree. Like this is a big. So so one reason I was talking about the VAE and not say a GAN is that GANs really suffer from this from this, where there's really no way to quantitatively evaluate what you've got. Yeah. What does VAE stand for? Variational autoencoder. It's a little bit of math, but it's just one of these latent code models where you generate a code and then spit out an image based on that code. Uh, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Do, okay. But we can talk yeah. afterwards. Okay. Is there any other quick, like, okay. Yeah. If anyone has a fast question, I'm happy to talk a little more while we set up. Yeah, All right, you can have to follow up. Actually, why don't we take that offline All right. just to stay yeah. on time. Um, thank you, John. Let's speak here again. <laughs> Next up. We have uh, Jennifer Brennan. She is uh, my student, and uh, she's going to be talking about uh, hypothesis testing and experimental design. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, yep. So I'll be talking about estimating the number and effect sizes of non-null hypotheses. And just to motivate and explain this problem, I'd like to start with uh, the motivation of scientific experiments. So let's imagine you're a biologist, and you're studying fruit flies, scientific name Drosophila, and your question is, 
which of the 13,000 fruit fly genes inhibits a virus growth? So how are you going to, um, how are you going to study this? You're going to run the following experiment. For each of these 13,000 genes, you're going to uh, knock out gene I from the cells. Then you're going to infect these cells with some uh, fluorescent influenza virus. And then you're going to measure the fluorescence after maybe a day. And this is like more fluorescence indicates more virus growth. And maybe you repeat this experiment two times for each of the 13,000 genes so that you can then like average the results and maybe decrease some of the noise. Um, the question that you're trying to answer here is which of the genes significantly increase the influenza growth? Uh, and this is, would be compared to the, the control measurement. And so what's the actual like, thing that you're going to measure? Well, maybe you'll take the fluorescence uh, after having knocked out gene I. You're going to divide that by the fluorescence of the control group. And then you're going to take the log. This is going to be our test statistic. And the idea is it's going to be close to zero if the gene doesn't affect flu growth. And it's uh, under this transformation, we're going to expect it to be normally distributed. So let's say you do this experiment, 13,000 genes, two replicates per gene. You're going to average them together, get these statistics. And um, again, we said uh, if we distributed normal zero, one, uh, if there's no effect. And uh, we can plot the density of um, the test statistics that, that you'd get. And this is like a, a real experiment uh, that, that the people have done. And here's like their, their real data. So you can plot their test statistics. And then remember we said that if there was no effect, uh, we thought that this uh, was going to, that the ratio, uh, the log ratio was going to be around zero. So we want to ask um, when can we say that it is significantly different from zero? We can uh, compute it. It would be this, this dashed line here. The idea is anything above this dashed line, we're going to say, oh, this gene had a significant effect on uh, the flu virus growth. And we can see here that very few genes are marked as significant under this protocol, which perhaps isn't surprising. We only took two replicates. There were a lot of genes. Um, but remember that I told you that it's this uh, test statistic will be distributed normal 0, 1 if there is no effect. So we could also plot this uh, against just the plot of like a normal 0, 1 distribution. And we see that it doesn't really line up. And in particular, uh, the actual data has a much heavier right tail than the theoretical normal 0, 1 distribution predicts. And this suggests that there are uh, like perhaps many genes with positive effects, but those effects might be kind of small. Um, so the question we'd like to ask is, how many effects are there in this right tail? Like, How many genes really do have some sort of effect on, on influenza growth? And then how large are these effects? Um, so this is the uh, question that we're trying to answer. Uh, so one way we could answer it is we could just go and try to like find all of these genes with small effects. So we could go back to our original experiment, and instead of doing two replicates per gene, we could now do 10. And uh, this will like, decrease the noise in our measurements, and this will allow us to um, uh, to really like identify these small effects much more much more easily, but the problem here is that there's there's this curve that describes the number of replicates you have to do to identify like a size of effect, and so as the effect size gets smaller, you need to do a lot more replicates um, in order to, to identify them, and um, this could be really bad if you're trying to find like a really small effect. Like if you expect that there are a lot of uh, genes that maybe only influence flu like replication slightly. Um, and you, maybe you wouldn't want to do like 10 replicates for each of 13,000 genes just to see whether there are any genes with this small effect. Like maybe that's just a very expensive experiment. So you might ask the question, can we count the number of genes with the small effect size? Uh, and it, like, is that an easier problem than going out and identifying them? So this leads to a, a more formal problem statement. Can we count the number of genes with each effect size using fewer samples than you would need to identify these genes? Um, and so this is what we do in our project, uh, and I'll just I'll just show you like the results we get on this on this data set. So uh, what I've plotted here on the x-axis is the effect size. So this is like uh, how much this gene uh, affects like the growth of influenza, and on the y-axis we have like the fraction of genes uh, that have this effect size. And this uh, dashed line shows what you get if you're if you're just trying to identify the genes with these effect sizes. And you can see that there's not very many genes you can find. By contrast, if you use our estimator. Uh, our estimator doesn't actually like, identify the genes for you, but it tells you how many there are. And so, for example, uh, our estimator tells you that over 10% of the genes have some effect on um, influenza replication. Uh, now, you can look at points on this curve. And so, for example, point A says at least 8% of the genes have this effect size, at least point 0.1. Um, then you can look at point B. There's like fewer genes with a larger effect size. And these can be really useful from a scientific perspective for suggesting experimental designs. So for example, um, let's say you're a scientist and 
you really care about actually like going out and finding these genes, um, now you can, you can do uh, two different types of experimental designs. Maybe you could, uh, like the design suggested by point A, would be you could take a lot of samples to isolate these small effect sizes, and then this, this would identify many genes. Like this spot will tell you, like you'll, you'll get, you know, 8% of the genes, like you'll identify as significant with this, this experimental design. Uh, or point B, B would suggest that you could take fewer samples to identify these like, larger effect sizes, uh, and then you would get like uh, fewer genes with, with a larger effect. Um, so this, this sort of technique could be used to do this, this kind of experimental design. Um, now I'll tell you about like this form, formal problem setting, so what did we solve as, as a math, math problem? Um, so formally, we're going to start with a mixing distribution nu star, uh, and this is going to be a distribution over effect sizes. So the effect size is like, uh, kind of in reality, like what's the true effect of the gene? Um, and just to, to point out, so in this example that I have up on the, on the slide, 10% uh, of the genes had no effect, so this is effect size zero. And then, um, sorry, 90% had no effect. And 10% had uh, some other effect, which is distributed somewhere between like, you know, zero and, and six. Um, that's the mixing distribution. Then there is a, a test statistic distribution, which is just uh, the mixing distribution plus this normal zero one noise. And the idea is, if we could observe this whole test statistic distribution, then our life would be easy because we could deconvolve it with normal, the normal zero one distribution and get back exactly the mixing distribution. And then if we had a question about the mixing distribution, we could just answer it. But we don't get to observe the test statistic distribution. Instead, we observe you know, 13,000 samples from it and we get maybe this you know, histogram density plot, whatever. Now it's kind of noisy. Now the question is, given these observed test statistics, now what can we say about the mixing distribution? Um, so formally, uh, our goal is to estimate the number of effect sizes above some threshold gamma. Again, this is a threshold on the effect sizes. So in this case, if, if gamma were this value, like 1.5 or whatever, it would be like the fraction of that mass that was to the right. And one of our constraints for this problem is we never want to overestimate the true number of, for example, genes with, with this effect size. And this is because, this goes back to our motivation of uh, experimental design. We want to be able to make guarantees like if you allocate this many uh, replicates per sample, then you will find, you know, these, you know, five genes that have a, a, uh, an influence on virus replication or something. And being able to like make that guarantee corresponds to not overestimating the true number. Um, cool. So how are we going to do this? Uh, now I'm going to describe like, how we solve this problem, our estimator. Uh, we're going to start with the uh, empirical cumulative distribution function of the test statistics. So an example is shown on the slide. Then what we're going to do is we're going to generate confidence intervals around the true CDF. Um, basically the idea is with high probability, the true CDF lives somewhere in this gray band. And we get these confidence intervals through something called the DKW inequality. Um, so, okay, now we're just going to consider the, these confidence intervals uh, and they, they kind of they tell us the following thing. Like for example, the blue distribution is a mixture of Gaussians that could be the true CDF. The red distribution is a mixture of Gaussians that could not be the true CDF because it like leaves this confidence interval. And uh, in fact, this red distribution is normal zero one, which uh, as you might recall is the distribution we would get if uh, none of the genes had any effect. So we know right off the bat that we can, uh, that it is not true that none of the genes have any effect, AKA there are some genes with an effect. Uh, what are we going to do for our estimator? Uh, we're going to find the CDF that stays in this interval that has the least amount of mass above the threshold gamma. And the idea here is that by choosing the one with the least amount of mass, uh, we will not overestimate the true amount of mass and we'll be able to provide this like guarantee on the number of, of discoveries you would make. Um, this estimator has a number of nice theoretical properties. So uh, this optimization we do in step three is a convex program so we can compute it efficiently. Um, the fact that we're using these uh, uh, confidence intervals means that our constraint is satisfied with high probability. And then also, uh, we're able to show finite sample lower bounds on our estimator, which essentially translates into, um, uh, you can say things like, you need uh, the, the number of samples that you take to be at least, you know, this large in order to, um, uh, in order to estimate the amount of mass above the threshold with, with some degree of accuracy. Uh, so yeah, uh, our, our hope is that this could be used for experimental design uh, in, these, in these sorts of settings in the future. Uh, happy to take questions. Okay. So you use some inequality to build this uh, confidence interval. 
when I'm used to building confidence intervals, I'm doing it in theory where I can say, oh, we'll just throw on a factor of 10 or a factor of 20 and that's totally gonna be fine. But in your scenario, a factor of 10 or 20 is actually a big deal. So do your confidence intervals kick in with those same constants or what, how do the constants work for, for you? Great, thank you. So the question was about the uh, constants in this inequality. So, okay, so the DKW inequality, it turns out, um, like, we know the tight constant in the DKW inequality. So, uh, and in particular, it's, it's like the, the two up here. So this, uh, where, whatever written on the slide, this plus or minus the square root of log two over alpha over two N. So uh, N here is the number of, for example, like genes you have, so this would be like 13,000 in our case. Alpha is the confidence interval, so like with probability one minus alpha, you stay in this, in this interval. And this is literally like exactly the bound. You don't even, there's no other constants, uh, nothing like that, yeah. So this is the exact form. Okay, let's take the speaker again. Next up we have uh, Willie. He is advised by Pedro Dominguez and Sid Sudavasa, and uh, he's, he's gonna be talking about reinforcement learning and control. Yeah, so clearly I do robots and not I guess I was networking or systems or something. Um, yeah, so our own control algorithms can get robots to do um, a lot of pretty cool things. Um, uh, so here we have the OpenAI shadow hand manipulating a cube, um, and then also uh, a couple things in simulation, learning to walk and learning to, to move objects around. Uh, so generally they use object information to get this. And by object information, I, I mean a variety of things. Um, anything from object segmentations to object um, poses, uh, so translation and rotation, um, to even object meshes and like mass and friction parameters to have like a full simulation to do all sorts of planning in. Um, and when they don't do this, when they're just learning from like literally pixels, um, they're generally very sample and efficient and, and brittle. So learning using object information is a good thing. However, there are no general purpose vision systems for robotics. Um, there's a ton of vision work out there, um, but with the exception of like some classical stuff, uh, I guess with deep learning, you have a data set, you train on that data set, and then your algorithm works on that data set. Um, and, and nobody's, or, or at least, uh, so if you're a roboticist, you have to restrict yourself to that data set the vision algorithm was trained on, um, or you have to like painstakingly collect your own data set and then retrain this deep learning algorithm on your own data set. Um, so I know that uh, in my lab, in Sid's lab, another group spent several weeks collecting a mashed potato data set because they wanted to be able to like segment uh, mashed potatoes. Um, and that was like, you know, several weeks, a lot of undergrad labor, um, a lot of like deep learning expertise to get it working. Um, and so obviously this isn't like sustainable. Um, it'd be nice to have something better. Uh, so I've been working on training a vision system that um, uh, for any object or like set of objects uh, will output some different things that are useful for robotic control and learning, specifically the segmentation of that object. So like all the pixels in the image corresponding to that object. Um, the object's 3D mesh and the object's uh, 60 pose. So to do this, we need lots of labeled training data to generalize across all objects um, because this is deep learning. Uh, no such data set exists um, in part because labeling uh, real data sets like this is, is very difficult. Um, not only do you need the, all the pixels corresponding to the object, you somehow need to like get the object's 60 pose and the object's model across you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of different types of objects. Um, it would be incredibly difficult to get this in the real world. Um, so to solve this problem, uh, we created a large simulated data set of ShapeNet objects. Um, and ShapeNet is a repository of about 50,000 uh, 3D meshes. And we labeled them with segmentation, pose, and of course we have the mesh. Uh, so over here um, on the left, uh, we have uh, one image in our data set. So it's a bunch of objects sitting on a table. Um, in the middle, we have the segmentations of those objects. And then on the right, um, we have one of the voxelized models for those objects. Um, and we have about 1.4 million uh, such pieces of training data. 
So uh, now I'm going to talk about the architecture we use to do this. Um, we use SSC to use segment objects uh, from an RGBD image. Um, so up here is, is SSC. I encourage you to look at the paper if you want to uh, know more about it. Um, and from that, we get segmentation masks. Um, and then we use part, parts of genre um, on the segmentation masks and depth images uh, to produce object meshes. Um, and once we have object mes meshes, we can actually get object poses um, by kind of mapping the mesh back into the scene. So another key part about this work is we want it to, to work on real robots. This isn't just like uh, getting some performance on, on some like vision benchmark. Um, so we test this by setting up a Mujoko physics simulation uh, of Herb, which is a robot in our lab, um, rearranging objects uh, using the MPVI algorithm for control. Um, so on the left is, is Herb's view, and Herb is moving the black box to the gray box. Um, and you'll also see the blue box, and this is where our vision system um, has perceived this black box to be. Um, and it's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's okay now. Um, we're making it better. Um, uh, but, you know, promising initial results. And on the right, uh, these are the segmentations. So, yeah, um, this is hopefully going to be, like, a pretty big project. Um, Right now, uh, the deep learning systems are very much constrained by the number of 3D models in the data set, um, and a lot of like interesting 3D models are miss missing. There's not much food, uh, for example. Um, and also, I want to have better rendering and video sequences. Um, and there's a lot more stuff I, I want to work on with this, too. Um, so if you're interested in collaborating or like putting this system on your robot, um, drop me a line. Thank you. Questions? How how accurate do the physics simulators need to be? Uh, yeah, so you're like, kind of like getting all this stuff from ShapeNet, and it seems like that's really heavily curated. Yeah, so that is kind of an issue. I think it depends on your task. For rearrangement, they probably don't need to be super good. Um, for something like grasping, especially if you want to do calculations with geometry, then the reconstructed model does need to be really good, and, and that means that like the limitations of ShapeNet is probably going to hurt you. Um, so, so one thing I'm looking at, like if you just like Google 3D models, there are like hundreds of thousands of them. Um, so, like, how can I turn this into like a high quality data set that I won't get sued over releasing? Um, Johan. Yeah, so, so we're using PyBullet, which is kind of like a game engine, although it's designed for, for research. Um, uh, we were considering using um, Unity. The, the issue with the game engine is they're meant for game developers, and it would be very difficult to kind of expose the interface I, I need for them. Um, uh, but there are people working on using like OpenGL to, to make like high quality rendering. Um, but like it would be nice if game developers would just like Give me their games. Um, <laughs> Any more questions? Cool. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, we have uh, Aravind Radhaswaran. He's uh, advised by Sham Kakade and Emil Todorov. Um, and he's also going to give us another great talk about robots, I think. Or Hopefully. learning. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Take it away. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I work on learning and optimization for robotics. And today, I'm going to be talking about what benefits do we gain by combining them. Uh, so the setting of interest in this particular talk is solving hard optimal control problems when we have access to some sort of a generative model. And this could be a physics engine or a neural network dynamics model. I'm going to be agnostic to the source of the model and assume that we have a model. Uh, so here is a particular example where uh, the same open AI system that uh, Willie me briefly mentioned. So the task is the agent has to control a five-fingered anthropomorphic hand shown over there to manipulate the block and uh, make a desired face point upwards. This is a very hard control problem because it requires careful coordination of many different joints. 
uh, to accomplish this task and manipulate the block. Uh, so how did OpenAI actually end up doing this? Well, they used this approach of simulation to reality transfer, meaning they train a policy, a neural network policy in simulation, and then transfer it into the real world and show that it actually works on the, hard, on the robot. Uh, while this is uh, very appealing and works great, and it's an amazing feat of engineering, it is still somewhat underwhelming for a few reasons. If you look at the amount of computational resources that are used, uh, it's about a few thousand computers running on some cluster trained for two days to solve this particular problem. Uh, so a reasonable question to ask is, can we make uh, algorithms that are more efficient than this while still achieving similar performance? And in particular, can we design algorithms that use the simulator more integrally? Uh, so that brings us to the main topic of the talk, which is the plan, online, learn, offline, or polo algorithm. So this algorithm actually can solve hard control problems like dexterous manipulation and humanoid locomotion in about one hour on a single laptop. So contrast this to two days of 1,000 computers running in a cluster to something very, very cheap. And again, the agent is tasked with controlling that particular hand such that it manipulates the block to make the pose match the desired pose visualized on the left. So what's this polo? What goes into it? Well, it's effectively combining two components, like the title advertised. We are going to combine online optimization or model predictive control with value function learning. And I'll describe both shortly. Uh, the key point is that there is a synergistic relationship between the two, such that if we put them together, the combination is better than the individual components. Uh, so model predictive control, or online optimization, is a control as a class of control algorithms that has been very successful in many applications from uh, chemical process control to robotics. And it's actually easier to explain it visually. So let's say we have the task of the blue agent trying to get to the green target. What model predictive control does is it considers different candidate action sequences, runs them through the generator model to hallucinate pot possible potential futures. Uh, and these potential futures are hallucinated only up to some particular horizon length. And then uh, we evaluate the, the cost or the reward of each of these trajectories. And in this particular case, the middle one is the closest to the target. So we pick that, execute the first action from that particular action sequence. We transition to state S3. We repeat the whole process again starting from the state. So it's effectively an instance-specific optimization problem that we solve uh, at runtime. So whenever we find ourselves in a particular state, we solve an optimization problem starting from that state to compute what is the correct action to use. This has a whole bunch of benefits, but I want to only touch upon one in particular, which is that it is very robust to distribution mismatch. There is no notion of a deep network trained on some distribution here. We are solving an optimization problem at runtime, and as a result, it can be very resistant to perturbation. So what is shown over here is a deep neural network policy that is uh, making a robot run. And this actually runs very successfully under some distributions. But if I apply some small perturbation visualized by the red force over there, uh, it puts it in a configuration that was low probability under the training distribution. And as a result, the policy is not able to work well in those states, and it leads to catastrophic failure. Whereas online optimization would be robust to this form of perturbations. Having said that, it has a whole bunch of limitations as well, the most important of which is that it incurs a short horizon bias. So remember, we only look ahead for some amount of steps. And why is that? It is because there is a strict real-time uh, time constraint. So if we have to control the robot and compute an action once every second, we cannot say, dear robot, please wait for five minutes for me to compute the action. If the robot is about to fall down, the gravity is not going to wait for us, and the robot is going to fall down and break itself. So, uh, how do we overcome this limitation? Well, a reasonable guess is we can try to use learning to overcome some of these limitations. And in particular, we're going to draw upon what's called value function learning. So value function at a particular state measures how favorable it is to be in that state in the long term. So the reward function says immediately how good is the state, whereas the value function says how good is the state in the long term. So we can, we can parameterize a value network that takes us input the current state and basically says whether that particular state is good or bad. And uh, we can train this by minimizing the Bellman error shown over there. And once we have a policy, we can try to recover, uh, once we have a value function, we can try to recover the actions by essentially behaving greedily with respect to the value function. Uh, while appealing, again, it has a whole bunch of challenges. Uh, the first is kind of important, which is error amplification, which is even if we have a reasonably good value function with low Bellman error, 
when, when using it to recover the actions, we actually get a huge degradation in performance. And that is because any error that may be present in the value function translates into the policy in an almost a worst case way. And it's very undesirable. And secondly, it has a very complicated optimization landscape. If you look at the loss function, it has a max operator actually embedded inside the loss function itself. And it's also a fixed point equation relating how values in a particular state relate to values in other states. And that this makes uh, the optimization landscape very ill-conditioned. Uh, so how can we put them together and combine them? Well, a very natural guess is that we're going to uh, take the same model predictive control problem as before, but put the value function at the end. So what that means is that we again hallucinate a few potential uh, futures, but then there is another function out there that is telling us if the final state is good or bad. So in this particular case, uh, in the bottom two trajectories, uh, even though the immediate costs may be very good because the, the middle one is the one that takes us closest to the target immediately, the value function tells us that, okay, that state is actually bad. If you go there, it will take you longer to recover and go back to the target state. Whereas the top state is good under the value function, and the model predictive control is aware of it, and as a result, gains long horizon foresight. Uh, another nice benefit that comes out of it is the, is the converse, which is that model predictive control can also now stabilize the learning of the value function. I don't have time to go over it right now, but it is essentially an expansion of the Bellman equation that makes the optimization landscape better behaved. So the value function helps the model predictive control part, and model predictive control helps the value function learning part. So just to summarize, uh, when we are designing control algorithms, uh, there may be four considerations that we really care about. We want globally near optimal performance. We want fast training times, meaning the amount of time it takes before we actually deploy the solution. We want fast inference, meaning at deployment time, we don't want to be consuming too much computational resources. And finally, we want to be robust to perturbations, which is a very important consideration in robotics. Uh, pure reinforcement learning almost finds globally near optimal solutions, and it's very fast in inference, meaning we just do one power drop and we're done. However, it's horrendous in terms of training time. It takes forever, as we saw, and it's also not robust to perturbations, which is very undesirable for robotics. Fewer model predictive control, on the other hand, uh, is very robust to these distributional mismatches, but only finds local solutions, but finds these local solutions fairly quickly. Now we can put them together, and what we, come up, what, what we get by combining model predictive control and learning in the right way uh, is that we can do uh, favorably on all the considerations that we really care about in robotics. Uh, and with that, I want to thank all my awesome collaborators here, and I'm happy to take questions as well. Yes, so uh, as, as far as the meta algorithm of Polo is concerned, we can use any MPC algorithm. The specific one that we used is a variant of model predictive path integral control. Um, yeah, it, it's one of the kind of uh, sampling based uh, model predictive control algorithms. So I guess issues with SimTheReal are, are a big um, problem for these. Mm -hmm. uh, have you like, examined its robustness to this? Yes, uh, we have and others have as well. Uh, my personal take is that pretty much any success story of robotics out there is based on SimTorial. Uh, I believe SimTorial works, and people who say it doesn't have an agenda. That's about it. Well, some fighting words there. Uh, let's thank Arvind again and uh, all the speakers.